welcome to everyone that has joined us for the very first in our Profiles in the Justice Profession webinar series. We're happy to have you. Um, just to cover a few logistical items, we are recording this sessions. Um, captions have been enabled. So if you would like to use the closed captioning, you can turn them on and off using the Zoom controls at the bottom of your screen. And the chat function is on as well. So we do encourage you to use the chat um, for the second half of our conversation. We will be opening up the floor for questions. Um, so we welcome your comments in the chat there. And with that said, I am very excited to introduce you to our host, Frank Schmeliger, and our guest of honor, John Feldmeyer. So welcome to both of you. Dr. John Feldmeyer is a professor at Wright State University and former civil rights and criminal defense attorney. As a professor, he teaches constitutional law, civil rights and civil liberties, criminal law, criminal procedure, and the U.S. Supreme Court and public ethics. As an attorney, Dr. Feldmeyer practiced in the areas of First Amendment rights, criminal defense, and civil rights. He also served as co-counsel for the Free Speech Coalition before the United States Supreme Court in Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition, where the court struck down a federal statute seeking to criminalize expression in cyberspace and other forms of virtual reality. And among other things, he is also the co-author of four books, including Constitutional Law and Criminal Law and Procedure for Legal Professionals, published by Pearson. Dr. Frank Schmoliger is a distinguished professor emeritus at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. He holds degrees from the University of Notre Dame and the Ohio State University, having earned both a master's and doctorate in sociology from the Ohio State University with a special emphasis in criminology. For 20 years, he taught criminology and criminal justice courses at the University of North Carolina. And for the last 16 of those years, he chaired the Department of Sociology, Social Work and Criminal Justice. The university named him Distinguished Professor in 1991. He is the author of numerous articles and more than 40 books, his most recent being the 17th edition of Criminal Justice Today, published by Pearson. Frank and John, welcome. We are so happy to have you with us today. Frank, I will turn it over to you to continue this conversation. Thank you, Rachel. And welcome, Professor Feldmeyer. I'm very glad that you could join us today, and I certainly appreciate you being, being with us. I'd like well, to thank start you, Frank. With, Thanks for I'd the like invitation. To, yes, definitely. And by the way, you and I go back a, a ways. We've done a number of projects together, so it's kind of like old home week here in this interview. That it is. But I'd like to start with a few questions. Uh, first, I know that you wear a number of hats but I'm particularly interested in your training as a criminal defense attorney and civil rights attorney. What is your story? How did you start out? What was the path that led you to where you are today? Sure. Uh, well, I was, uh, I grew up, I was one of four children, um, grew up in Columbus, Ohio. We had no one in the family, in the neighborhood, among our acquaintances uh, as a lawyer. Uh, so there was no really real connection with anyone to, to directly as a role model, but I did enjoy uh, a student government uh, as a child and as a, a high school and college student. There was a moment in my path, uh, just idiosyncratic uh, instance uh, during the summer break, when I was reading a book and my mom happened to walk by and just off the cuff said, you really seem to enjoy reading. Maybe you should become a lawyer. Uh, first time any connection or reference to uh, the law uh, legal profession was ever referenced. But that little seed, as small as it was, uh, seemed to grow through high school and college. And when I went to college, that was kind of the intention. I was going to college so that I could then proceed to law school. Um, when I did, I kind of really became enamored with constitutional law. I, I just really connected with the idea of kind of 
regulating government through the written word and how it impacted individuals and civil liberties and kind of all of the things we know and love about constitutional law. And so when I started law school, you know, everybody asks in the, in the class, what do you want to do? What kind of law do you want to practice? And there's the corporate lawyers and the personal injury lawyers and the probate and the bankruptcy and the tax lawyers. And I said, somewhat ignorantly, I said, I want to be a constitutional law lawyer. And, uh, and I got a lot of laughs because no one calls themselves that. Uh, and, and it's not really an area that you seek out. It's kind of a side dish to other main courses of, of law. Uh, but but I was committed. I, I wanted to do constitutional law. And so that was kind of where I stayed, uh, stayed focused, did my four years of college, graduated from law school after three years. Uh, but um, the economy had other ideas uh, for me. And I went on to graduate school afterwards where I received my Ph.D. in, in political science. Uh, and then I started legal practice uh, after that. Initially, I was with the Ohio Ethics Commission. Uh, did a period of time with them in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, my wife, who's a lawyer as well, uh, graduated from law school, and she got invited to work as a lawyer in Cincinnati, Ohio. So um, we had to sort things out. Uh, how's this going to work? And um, so I started putting my hat in the ring down in uh, Cincinnati and fortunately found a, a law firm that that specialized in uh, criminal defense. And so for me, it was a great connection. Essentially, criminal law and criminal procedure is a lot of constitutional law in the criminal justice setting. And so uh, it was, a, at least for me, a, a very good match and uh, had some excellent lawyers to work with, people who've been doing it for many, many years, and was able to get that type of kind of on-the-job training, the practical experience uh, right from the beginning. Frank, I'm sorry. I think you're on mute still. You may have muted yourself while John was talking. Ah, you're right. Thank you very much, Rachel. Yes, and uh, so, uh, Professor Feldmeyer, when you went from uh, being a student to uh, being a professional, what were some of the uh, steps that you took that uh, led you into the field? And what was it really that drew you into the field? Well, I, I'm not sure what the uh, connection was, but I, I wanted to represent individuals who needed a lot of help. I mean, the, the kind of the David versus Goliath uh, uh, scenario where I wanted to represent the Davids uh, of the world. Um, in law school, I had my dream job uh, put in front of me by way of an interview was with the Ohio Public Defenders Commission, and they had four openings my third year of law school. One was with the uh, death penalty division. And so you would represent death row inmates throughout the state of Ohio in their habeas corpus uh, petitions. And I, I just thought you couldn't write up um, a more suitable job for someone like me. And, and so I, I interviewed and uh, was told I had the, the job. All I had to do was pass the bar and it would be mine. Life was going to be good. But then Ohio had a gubernatorial election. We elected a new governor. And in the middle of my third year of law school, uh, the new governor came on board and immediately imposed a hiring freeze. Uh, so <laughs> there went the job. It was sitting right there, graduated, passed the bar exam, but the, the job was not allowed to be filled. So um, it, uh, it was a disappointment. It was a setback, of course, in that area. But it really did kind of stoke the fire in terms of that interest and that commitment, wanting to represent individuals who weren't going to be the most popular people uh, that, you know, again, were in many cases uh, fighting an uphill climb. Uh, the odds were not in their favor. And whether it was the contrarian in me that uh, just wanted to, you know, uh, take on a, a task like this or perhaps some kind of more altruistic uh, interest in, in helping those who, who would not find a lot of help through the majoritarian process, politically, economically, or, or legally, um, it still it became a passion of mine. And of course, it spilled over into an interest in the civil rights work as well. Much of the free speech uh, work that I did, where we handled cases involving the First Amendment 
were criminal cases at the outset. Uh, someone did something, they posted something, they created something, they said something that got them into criminal trouble, that got them charged with, with a crime. And so a lot of the free speech development came along for the ride with uh, some of the criminal uh, defense work that I was doing. But um, that that even today remains a passion of mine to, 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 to help those who perhaps are not going to get help through some majoritarian style uh, systems of, 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 of help. Yes, and you mentioned uh, politics and even earlier economics uh, both played a role in your in your career path, impacted you in, in personal ways. It, uh, it did. Um, so as I mentioned, I was involved in student government and the thought was that I was going to go into politics. Um, it's probably just a desperate cry for attention as a teenager or something of that nature. But I saw politics as something I really wanted to do. I loved elections. I loved campaigning. I worked on a number of campaigns and I just thought that's where I wanted to go. At the time, this was in the late 70s, 80s, uh, the most common uh, background of our legislative body of members of the legislative body was that of lawyer. Uh, and so I just saw that as kind of a pathway to being able to do what I wanted to do in terms of um, uh, the political uh, end of it. But then after running a couple of campaigns, um, I saw saw more than I, I wanted to see. And um, uh, I decided I wasn't going to go the political route, but really got interested in uh, the legal profession at that time. Well, certainly politics is always interesting. And even in today's world, uh, some years later, we have a lot of uh, political activities going on and uh, a lot of lawyering really at, at all levels. Absolutely. But, uh, tell, can you tell me how uh, how the process has changed in the intervening years from when you were a young student coming out of law school? Uh, how has it changed in terms of uh, getting into perhaps the legal field uh, today? Yeah, there, there's a lot of things that have changed about the legal profession, um, particularly in the information age from when I started to now. I mean, when I started, when we filed things with the court, they were hard copy. They were paper driven. Um, we used our fax machine a lot. Um, and today that process uh, has gone almost in all cases by way of the electronic uh, submissions. But the actual pathway to law school, the pathway from law school to the bar exam, the bar exam to the legal profession, largely has not changed uh, much. Um, I mean, there's a tweak here and there, the, how you might take the bar exam on a computer versus uh, uh, using a, a pen or, or pencil, little things like that. But the basic pathway, really, substantively speaking, has remained fairly constant. Uh, you graduate from college, typically at, at some point, if you're gonna go from college to law school, you start applying to law school your, your senior year, typically in the fall. Um, for others, perhaps later in their, their life, post-college, during a career, they might decide to go to law school, but there's the application process for law school. You typically do three years of uh, legal um, work of legal study and law school, and then you take a bar exam. And so that has kind of remained constant over the last many years. The one little insert that I've noticed since I did it many years ago is that for a lot of states, ours included here in Ohio, they've added, and they did this even some time ago, but after I went through the process, an ethical component. So there's a, an ethics exam that is a component or an addition to the general bar exam on your on your topics, on your doc, doctrinal topics. So there, there has been that slight change in terms of what you would take and uh, an exam you would have to satisfy, but it's still the, the pretty much the same. You need to pass a bar uh, and get licensed and then go out into the world terms of getting a job, um, you know, the opportunities are parallel to what I experienced. You can you can go it alone. You can hang out your shingle, as they say, kind of set up shop, start from the beginning uh, as a new lawyer uh, with no clients, and you just incrementally try to build up a practice. 
You can try to uh, get hired with the law firm that might be doing some criminal work and uh, begin there where you have kind of a foundational resource base that you can tap into. Uh, but for a lot of students, they will work perhaps as a law clerk for uh, a judge, federal or state, get some experience, some exposure that way, um, and then decide to to go into the practice. And that's been those pathways that were there, you know, 30, 40 years ago when I started and they remain today uh, virtually. So nothing terribly dramatic in terms of the trajectory or the pathway uh, to the profession that I've seen. Well, a question uh, just kind of off the cuff. It came to mind while you were speaking. Uh, what do you think the influences of uh, AI or artificial intelligence on uh, on the profession today? Yeah, sure. I mean, they've obviously been enormous. Um, I mean, the things we can do um, from from the client interviews. I mean, my my law firm was downtown, and uh, I mean, just having clients come to your office obviously presented a number of of challenges for some some clients. Uh, today, obviously, we can do a lot of the, these things uh, remotely. AI itself, um, you know, we're still kind of in the middle of that development in, in many ways, but it has opened up the doors uh, substantially for criminal defense lawyers um, in terms of gathering evidence, in terms of forensic sciences, uh, the ability to defend uh, clients uh, uh, it has widened. Uh, there's so many other options in terms of using, you know, cell phone pings and other electronic data. It's also generated a lot more criminal cases, of course. I mean, the what you put in a text or a tweet or a Instagram, a photo you would take, uh, you know, so much of that can actually bring a person uh, criminal charges. But um, it does present opportunities for criminal defense lawyers to 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 use those electronic sources as potential mitigators or perhaps even alibis. Uh, I've had cases where, you know, the ping on a cell phone to the cell tower uh, was evidence that they could not have been in the place that the government alleged that they would have been had they committed the crime. So it has um, created a lot of opportunities. But obviously, it's generated a, a lot of new platforms for uh, charging criminal cases. Right, yeah, that's a fascinating, fascinating area, and I think we'll see a lot more changes coming down the pike. But uh, back, back to your career, and uh, I'm wondering what obstacles did you uh, encounter in your early career, and how did you overcome them? Okay. Well, the biggest obstacle I faced initially, um, and absent that job being taken from me <laughs> because of the hiring freeze. Um, when my wife got hired down in Cincinnati, she she had graduated from a Cincinnati law school. And so she had a connection, even though she didn't grow up in Cincinnati, um, uh, she had that connection. Well, at that time, and we're talking about 30 years or so ago, um, the, the legal profession here, and really, I think in a lot of other communities, was fairly insular. Um, the, the general thought rhythm perception was that unless you either went to law school in the town or you went to an Ivy League school, perhaps, and had some street cred that way, or you went to high school, uh, Cincinnati's kind of unique this way. The, the running joke in Cincinnati is when someone asks you, where did you go to school? They're not talking college. They're not talking law school. They're talking high school, right? Uh, all politics is local, right? They want to know, you know, kind of where you came from. Um, and that was very true um, 30 years ago. And so when I started reaching out, applying for positions, when my wife and I thought we were going to, wanted to move to Cincinnati, I got a pile of rejection letters. And speaking of AI, those were actual letters on paper telling you, no, thank you. Um, and so that was an uphill climb. Uh, that was a big obstacle. And it took several months uh, to make a connection, to, to, to get beyond that perhaps cultural um, resistance, if you will, to the so-called so outsiders coming into Cincinnati. And um, like I said, fortunately, I found a firm who was kind of, you know, had some contrarians among them, 
just just like me and it was it was a very good match and doing criminal defense work again you're you're kind of pushing back against uh kind of the dominant forces in society or in government and so um th- this this worked out very well but that was a, that was a pretty big obstacle at the time the other obstacle and it's just a reality of criminal defense is the stress um and i didn't appreciate this you know when i set out college law school i want to be a lawyer this is my path you know i went in it head first and uh was fairly confident about everything and had very few fears and i remember the the night before my very first jury trial now so i had been a lawyer at the law firm for just a short while i think maybe four months or something like that and and the uh um, we had a, a, a vehicular homicide case it was a very unfortunate, ugly, tragic uh, uh, case, as you would imagine. But it hit me that last that night before the start of the trial, the magnitude of what was involved, the responsibility that I had for another person's life. Uh, and it it kind of surprised me that it kind of came out. I wasn't anticipating it, but I I just kind of felt the full weight uh, of what was going to happen uh, starting the very next day. And that's one of those things where it didn't go away. We did get an acquittal, partial acquittal on that case. And so that 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 helps to mitigate some of the anxiety eventually. But, you know, that never goes away completely. Um, and I've worked with uh, very talented lawyers who've done this type of work much longer than I have. And they said many times, if you don't have butterflies, if you're not nervous before you go in on a on a trial during a trial, then it might be time to stop doing the practice. That that's part of the job. That's what gets you up. That gets what that's what gets you ready. Um, that's just part of the profession. And so, it, it was an obstacle. Uh, it's just something you have to kind of manage uh, in in various ways. But it's not something I expected going into the profession. Well, I, it brings to mind a story. I met a, a professor of mine, and he said much the same thing you did. Uh, I always admired this guy a great deal, and he was about to receive a uh, prestigious award and about to go on the stage and, and give a talk in recognition of the award. And I said to him, uh, and I was only a student at the time, so I didn't have much access to him other than in the classroom, but I said, uh, how is it you get up there on stage and you give these wonderful talks and uh, everyone really enjoys what you have to say? And uh, don't you get a little nervous when, when you go up there to talk? And he said, uh, using some words I can't use here, he said, uh, of course I do. Uh, he says, if I didn't get nervous, then my talks wouldn't be any good. So uh, he's echoing, I think, uh, what you said there as well. Uh, you need to be energized, uh, need to have that feeling come from somewhere that propels you to uh, to say what needs to be said uh, and with enthusiasm. But I know you, yes, you were going to say. No, I mean, fear can be a heck of a motivator. Uh, and uh, in, in terms of getting prepared for a case, I mean, knowing now every time that I would go into a, a, a trial that the fear was going to come, it drove the level of preparation. You wanted to make sure you had all your I's dotted, T's crossed, all the evidence, thinking about any particular response you might need to to come uh, to present in the in the case. Uh, it it really was um, a huge driver of of preparedness and uh, and and so yeah, to the extent you have fear or nervousness, whatever you want to call it, use it to your advantage. Uh, you know, kind of steer into the curve, allow it to motivate you to to be more thorough. Uh, and more competent. It's a good tip for uh, many professions. Now, I know you wear a number of different hats. Uh, You started out, uh, I believe, as criminal defense attorney, and uh, you transitioned into other areas. So can you tell us uh, what a day in your life looks like today? Uh, What is it that you do during, during a typical day? Yeah, so today, uh, as we speak, I'm a a professor of public law, and I 
teach courses, uh, as was shared during the introduction, constitutional law, criminal law, criminal procedure, public ethics, teach a moot court class. And so I'm up quite early. Uh, I've always been an early riser. The brain seems to work uh, better uh, in the early morning. And uh, so I'm up quite early. Uh, got two teenagers, so um, they get off to, to school and whatnot. But then I start at the beginning. If I don't have classes in a day, um, obviously, like most people, I'll check any uh, messages that I might have received overnight from students, uh, colleagues, any consulting uh, uh, projects I might be working on and take care of those. But a lot of it is preparing uh, for class. Uh, do a fair amount of writing. Uh, you and I teamed up a couple times on some wonderful projects. And so there seems to always be a, a research project or some publishing work that uh, uh, is at hand. And I can I can do that on the days that I don't have class. When I do have class, I'm usually in the office uh, at about 8, 8.30. I typically schedule early morning classes. So I'm usually in the classroom by about 9.30. Uh, and I'll teach at least two classes a day. I'll finish up probably early afternoon. Then I'll have office hours uh, in the in the mid afternoon, typically, and then perhaps committee meetings, service work uh, that goes along at the university, where you participate in various projects with other colleagues at the university. And then I usually get home uh, by early evening. We'll have a a meal and hopefully time to unwind. Um, I'm also on a local school board now, and so we have meetings at night as well uh, at, at, during the month. So, you know, we usually have about four or five meetings. Sometimes my evenings are occupied with uh, school board work. I'm active in the uh, uh, the community. My my kids play a lot of sports, and so hopefully I have time to, to go watch them and kind of root them on. But uh, yeah, you know, there is a lot to to balance. And I think this is true for a lot of professions. And so on the one hand, you could say it's overwhelming, or it's a lot of kind of um, weaving from one thing to the next or jumping from one thing to the next, and it can create a, a bit of distraction. But honestly, you know, I'm kind of uh, of the mind that, you know, variety gives spice to life. And, uh, and so I've, I've tended to try to you know, embrace that, uh, a change within a given day, uh, but it um, it it can be taxing uh, in terms of just keeping the schedule straight and uh, make sure you get, get on time. My my mom was a stickler for being on time, actually being early. So if you were on time, you were late in my mom's book. And so I'm kind of practiced always getting to places I need to be uh, well in advance. Um, and so that kind of stretches things a little thinner as well. But that's a typical day now. Um, when I was practicing criminal defense, the the rhythm was in some ways similar um, for criminal cases, at least in the areas where I practice. And this was southwestern Ohio federal state court. Most of our criminal cases began early in the morning. The, the criminal docket was heard in the morning, still is. Um, and so I would go straight from my home in the morning to the courthouse, handle however many cases I might have for that day. Sometimes you had a state case and a federal case. Sometimes you had three in the county courthouse and, and you had to go from, from courtroom to courtroom. Um, and you essentially handled the, the, the client's uh, case or, or scheduled courtroom appearances in the early morning. If you were lucky, you would get back to the office by 11 or 12. Um, now, again, these are days when you didn't have a trial scheduled or or some very substantial hearing. Get back to the, the uh, office and you would have a lot of research and writing to do. Uh, you would have motions to prepare for cases. You would have legal appellate briefs to write, to research and write and submit. And those were very time consuming. And you would use your afternoons, perhaps even evenings for that. And then again, if you were lucky, you would have clients that would want to come and see you, uh, perhaps to interview you for, for retaining you as, as, their, as their legal counsel. And so the afternoons, early evenings were uh, spent doing a lot of legal research and legal writing, and then um, a lot of client uh, conversations as well. 
Uh, and that really was really a, a six day a week uh, schedule. We uh, we worked usually Saturday mornings as well as the Monday through Friday schedule. Um, again, tried to leave around one o'clock in the afternoon or so to have uh, some semblance of a, a of a weekend. But it was uh, um, uh, a substantial uh, load of work. Uh, but but again, one that was very connected to people. I mean, you were representing people that you knew that you met. Uh, that you had a connection with, a bond with, uh, it was that human, you know, relationship that uh, made it meaningful, even though it, it was substantial work. Well, and I have to ask you, is there a, one moment, perhaps one day that stands out as a, as a highlight of your career? And if so, what would that be? But maybe it's a moment that's still to come. Uh, maybe there are some <laughs> plans that you have time that you might want to tell us about as well. Sure. Well, as Rachel said at the outset, I did have an incredible honor and opportunity to be part of a uh, a group of three lawyers. I was the third lawyer in the group to take a case to the United States Supreme Court. And uh, uh, that day will always be remembered in my mind. Uh, it, you talk about nerves, but it was an absolute um pleasure to be part of that, to be privileged enough to, to, to have that, that experience, to be in front of the high court uh, on a case involving, uh, really, at its core, it was a criminal law that we were challenging that was threatening to punish uh, criminal uh, expression uh, in, in cyberspace. And so uh, that day is going to stand out just because uh, the Supreme Court is regarded as the kind of the pinnacle of anyone's legal uh, experience if they ever have a chance to to get there. So that's that's going to be up there. But I'll tell you at the the other end of things, um, one of this I, I I did cases anything from your a jaywalking case up to a murder case, right, and everything in between. Your DUIs, your domestic violences, your disorderly conducts, fraud, drug trafficking, things of that nature. But there was another moment we have in Ohio, it's it's an oddity, but we have what we call mayor's courts. And these are courts that allow local municipalities to kind of handle misdemeanor cases in their local enclave, in their, in their small uh, municipal jurisdiction. Um, and, um, you know, they're typically held in a conference room or a uh, city council room or things of that nature. So it, they're all misdemeanor cases. Usually nobody's going to jail. It, you know, it's even though they could, it's just not that kind of thing. It's it's kind of what you might say, small potatoes kind of crime at the at the local level. Well, I had a client a number of years ago. He was a senior in high school. He had been accepted to college. He had been given a scholarship to this college. But as some seniors in high school do, he was celebrating his uh success in getting into college with a bunch of friends. And they had a, a party at a, at a house where the parents were not home. There was alcohol, uh, there was noise, and one thing led to another. And he got cited for underage consumption and criminal trespassing. So um, he got, he was an adult at that time. He had turned 18. And so he was cited to this mayor's court. Um, if it were just that, if it were just a criminal case, you know, these things happen, things can be worked out. Um, no one typically goes to jail for anything like that. It's not, like I said, the most severe of criminal cases. But he had a college acceptance and a scholarship that was riding on this. Uh, the belief was that if he had been convicted, he would lose a scholarship and um, perhaps even they would withdraw their their offer. And so we tried to work it out. Hey, this is something he can do. Could we perhaps do some community service? Uh, could he do a diversion program, maybe avoid a conviction altogether? Well, we were in a jurisdiction where the culture was, we don't plead anything out. Like you either go to trial or you plead as charged. There's no in between. That was just their rhythm. And so I was up against a brick wall. I said, well, we're going to trial. I mean, we're not going to plead this out. So this client, this 18-year-old man, young man, boy, he uh, uh, he was there with a slew of his family, mom, dad, brother, sister, grandparents. 
I think there was an uncle there as well. In this mayor's court, again, you're talking the smallest of smallest courts. And we tried the case. I think it lasted all of 20 minutes. I mean, it's municipal court. We had a couple of witnesses. They had a couple of witnesses. Things move rather, rather quickly. But at the end of the case, um, I heard words that I didn't think I was going to hear. And the judge said, not guilty. And the family comes rushing out onto the floor. It was the last case for the night. So there was nobody else waiting to have their case heard. They rush out. It, it it was kind of euphoria for them. And I mean, I was thrilled too as well, but, you know, a, a misdemeanor case, right? Uh, that that one stands out as kind of one of the high points uh, in the career. Among all these others, I mean, again, people with, you know, pre- facing far worse uh, potential consequences, but um, I, I, that one still always stands out in my mind. It's a testimony to your skills as an attorney. Indeed. Well, thank you, Frank. (laughs) Now, in terms of uh, students um, who are interested in entering a criminal justice or uh, a law career, what should students uh, be doing right now if they're planning to embark on a career Mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, if, if if you're still in college uh, as a student, you've got a lot of opportunities um, to do a lot of different things that would help you explore this. Now, if you were like me, I was headstrong going into college that, you know, I was going to law school. Nobody could have detoured me from that. So that was my pathway. But for some students, it's one of many options they've considered. And if you're in that situation, I would use my time at school to explore to dabble, if you will, to to try some things out uh, and and kind of see how they match up. Take a law class, a constitutional law, criminal law uh, class, law and society, um, intro to to legal process, whatever you might have, and just see how it resonates with you. I think, you know, of course, we live in this information age, this entertainment age. Um, We all have access to all kinds of pop culture renderings of what potentially law practice could be. And some of them are better than others. Some of them are more accurate than than others. Some of them are complete fantasies and don't match up whatsoever. And so um, this is an opportunity to to kind of explore and and see how well uh, you connect with the subject matter, right? And so use it for that. Then the other things, if you if you're really committed to go to law school, um, it, it perhaps isn't the law classes in college that are going to really prepare you um, uh, for for law school uh, perfectly. I mean, there's uh, other classes you want to consider, uh, classes that require a lot of writing. Uh, so whether it's an English lit class, um, uh, any type of um, paper driven class, a research class where you have to write. Um, I'll be honest, I was not a good writer uh, in high school or in college. I was an awkward writer. And um, instead of kind of just running away from it, I ran toward the light and just kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it. And after a while, a rhythm kind of was generated where kind of the the light came on and and it became easier. It became more natural. Um, And so for those who are perhaps reluctant, reluctant writers or hesitant writers or frustrated writers, keep at it, keep writing. This will serve you well in law school. I mean, your um, your success or lack thereof in law school is largely going to depend on how well you can communicate uh, in writing, particularly during your exams. But when you're writing briefs for legal writing class or maybe your appellate advocacy class, most of all of your exams are going to be essay. And again, how do you speak when you write. And the better you can do it, the more successful you'll be. So take as many of writing intensive, writing intensive classes as you possibly can. In addition, there's classes on logic, uh, inductive, deductive reasoning that can help with uh, law school, can help with the bar exam or the, uh, excuse me, the law school admissions or the LSAT test as well. A lot of inductive, deductive reasoning, analytical reasoning games there. You can take that typically through your philosophy department. So, you know, kind of widen your range. I know some students that have take, uh, taken acting classes, uh, go over into the performing arts, try out an intro to um, acting. Um, you know, 
don't have to tell too many people that much of law, much of legal practice is uh, theatrics, is performance, is being able to come across effectively in front of others, uh, public speaking courses, things where you have to think on your feet. So, you know, political science has always been kind of the most common pathway for law school because it has the law classes, it has political philosophy and has a lot of the terminology that you might use later on in law school. But I will tell you, uh, today's law school classes are made up of students from all different backgrounds, accounting majors, engineers, chemists, uh, virtually any background you can think of is going to be represented in a law school. So don't don't limit yourself to one area. Uh, try to, to broaden yourself. Ultimately, your college experience ought to be an experience, a, a self-development moment for you, not just kind of a preparedness uh, for law school. But if you are headed there, those are some of the things you might consider doing to kind of get you ready for that next step. Very good tips. Uh, all of the world is a stage, as they say. <laughs> like, uh, the acting uh, tip uh, for acting classes. But uh, with regard to a broader question, what do you think about uh, students who are considering getting into the criminal justice field today? I mean, there's a lot of pros and cons. People are you know, pro-police, anti-police, uh, and so on. Uh, and a lot of social justice issues involved as well, which of course go back to politics and perhaps some of the things you mentioned earlier. So is there uh, any advice that you would give to students who are thinking about a, uh, a general career in some aspect of the criminal justice field? Yeah, I, do your research, uh, do the deep dive. Uh, you know, as I said before, we, we are not short on uh, entertainment and social media renderings of, of the criminal justice system. And I think for a lot of us watching those, we think we know how it works or we think we know what it'll be like. Um, and yet the reality in a lot of settings, a lot of co legal communities can be quite different. Uh, those ultimate highs, those big wins um, for criminal defense lawyers are few and far between. Uh, you you judge your winning, if you will, uh, on a completely different scale. Uh, walking out of the courtroom with your client after a criminal trial is, is often the exception, not the rule. Um, and so you measure your success and the benefit you bring to a client uh, through things about, you know, maybe they were facing 10 years and through either plea agreement or some type of mitigation, uh, they only got two years of incarceration. Um, be prepared for that type of alteration of, of perception and reality, that it's not going to be that high every day. Um, and that to that extent, you're going to need a, a kind of a tougher skin of sorts, and you're going to have to measure your success, your help, your worth as a professional by sometimes different yardsticks. Um, but they're still there. There's still a lot of room to help people. Um, I mean, one of the plain realities of the criminal justice system is it it will create, um, it, it is a very stable profession in terms of job security. Uh, the, the, the cases keep on coming, the, the pressures, the budgetary demands, the public safety demands generally keep the process, the criminal justice system rolling. And so it, it it seems like there's always cases to be treated, always clients to be cared for. On the other side is prosecutors. There's always cases to, to try and to present. So there is a certain element, or at least there can be, of job security given the nature of the of the system in the United States. But for those thinking about going into it, do realize that what you see uh, on, you know, your your phone or your computer or wherever you get your kind of infotainment uh, may not be perfectly reflective of what's um, in, in in store for you in the profession. The other thing I'll say is is this too. I know the movement right now in a lot of educational cir circles is applied learning, and so I mean. I I went into a classroom eager to to just just let me do it. I mean, I just you know we all are eager to be able to actually do what we dream of doing. But there's a lot of foundational work that that should be done 
before we get into that actual practice of, of anything, of any profession, it could be nursing uh, or it could be uh, criminal defense. And even though it may not be the most exciting, even though it may not allow you to directly work on a case or with a client, um, it could be writing and reading intensive. It can be laborious work. It's that foundation that will serve you well in the long run. When you face a situation where you're not sure what to do, when you really are stressed about whether to go left, right, up, or down, some of those bedrock principles, some of those standards of, say, ethics or philosophy or professional decorum that hopefully you built in that foundation, hopefully those will be there for your recall and, and use. Um, I don't think it's any surprise, you know, today that we see a lot of corners being cut because of this rush to do whatever it is we want to do and the kind of either uh, minimize or completely uh, uh, ignore some of these fundamental components, particularly when it comes to ethics. Um, for, for most people, myself included, ethics didn't come naturally. And in some cases, it's counterintuitive. What you should do in a context, in any profession, may go against certainly what you want to do or maybe what your client wants you to do, right? And so there's a, it it's often isn't natural. And, and so ethics is one of those areas where you really have to work at it and build that foundation so that you have it um, when you come into a, a, a situation that, you know, takes some thinking. So um, general advice is do the work. Um, I know we all want to, you know, score the touchdown in the end, but it starts with a lot of push-ups, a lot of wind sprints, you know, a lot of toil uh, before we're going to get in the game and, and, and be the hero. It's interesting you mentioned ethics, and I see a question coming in from one of our uh, participants, and they're asking, with regard to ethics, are uh, the prosecutors today who regard themselves as progressive, or perhaps we could say liberal, are they ethical? And I guess the question really means, uh, and I can relate to it, when I go back and think about all the books I've written, I, I write about the job, the role of a prosecutor, the role of a defense attorney, the role of appointed counsel. And it seems to me like these people have predefined roles. And yet today, there are folks uh, like progressive prosecutors who have turned that role almost on its head, or at least turned it 180 degrees around. So uh, any thoughts on uh, what's happening today with progressive prosecution in, in certain jurisdictions? Yeah. So, I, you know, of course, I came up in an era where we were on the other side of the scale. We, you know, our Western system of justice is largely based on an adversarial process where we pit at least two sides against one another and make the best side win, essentially, using using evidence. You know, the running kind of advice and in, in legal requirement, ethical requirement of prosecutors is that they can strike hard blows, but they can't strike foul blows, like can't hit below the belt, so to speak. And and the fact that we see some of this development now with progressive prosecution or whatever you may call it, um, I, I don't know that it has changed the dynamic fundamentally, but it has at times uh, created a more well-rounded scenario. Things were afoot in, in criminal justice long before some of the developments we've seen over the last five years, particularly in the area of diversion programs. So someone comes into the criminal justice system having been charged with, say, a drug offense, possessing narcotics of some kind. And, and, and if the, the, the intake or some step along the process determines that they the root of their problem isn't that they you know, just wanted to get high or they just wanted to steal or they just wanted to do whatever it is they're charged with doing, but that they have a root dependency that will not go away just by locking them up, that, that, that the better path would be to, to address that, the root cause, as opposed to kind of having the highly publicized conviction. And, and just in terms of problem solving, that's a good pathway. I mean, forget criminal prosecution and you know, duty to the public and keeping streets safe. If you want to solve the problem or at least have a chance at solving the problem longer term, 
find the root cause and deal with it directly. So I think what I've seen, at least thus far, and obviously we're very early into some of this development, but it is really a, a more global treatment of individuals who are coming into the system, uh, looking at kind of the universe of how they got where they are, as opposed to just kind of a one size fits all, um, just process them the same way. You did something that violated the law. You need to be found guilty. You need to face the consequences, which is really um, a one dimensional approach, sometimes perfectly appropriate and necessary. I mean, we haven't thrown that out altogether. And some of the most severe cases that has to be done just for the purpose of keeping people safe. But in some of these other cases, I see it as a more global approach uh, to just fixing the, the the problems and the health that that plague a lot of our of our communities. Otherwise, we see what we've been seeing, the recidivism, people coming back again and again and again, because we didn't address the root problem. Uh, we just kind of hit it superficially, and often they will be back. I don't know if that was where you, you the question was uh, seeking me to, to address or perhaps. Well, I think that's a great answer. Uh, one other question that I think will uh, be out of time, but the question is, uh, what if, uh, if you take a client who admits to you that he's guilty or perhaps doesn't admit it, but you know for sure he must be guilty. Are you still uh, uh, going to defend that client? And if so, uh, what choices would you would you make in order to decide what you should do? Um, yeah, I, I mean, so I think for a lot of students, the thought is that the criminal defense lawyer is Superman or Superwoman, that they can swoop in and kind of save somebody from the oncoming train or the collapsing building. And it's, you know, kind of a get out of jail free card. Um, and, and your job is to acquit people at all costs. There is so much that is in between doing nothing and being that swooping, you know, superhero that you do as a criminal defense lawyer where you can make a real impact and be of true benefit to your client. First of all, just holding the government to their burden, making sure that what they allege, what they say, what they accuse has merit, has substance, is backed by evidence. Testing the evidence, is it what they say it to be? Uh, is there any other competing version of the facts? Uh, did the lab test measure up? Did they get the evidence legally? Um, did they acquire the breathalyzer test or the forensic results in a constitutional legal manner? Did they have a warrant? If not, did they fit one of the exceptions of the Fourth Amendment? Um, this is really just essentially making sure for the client that the accusations against them and the, the methodology used to get to that point are legitimate. Um, are sound, are constitutional, right? This is kind of coming back to the criminal defense lawyer as a constitutional lawyer, right? You're you're measuring the government's actions against this litmus test we call the Constitution. Then after that, again, some of the biggest benefit that your client's going to get is the way is to to potentially mitigate their harm, and this comes by way of plea negotiations, right? There's so much room that you can room for help when you negotiate a plea agreement for your client. Uh, again, in most plea agreements, they will be found guilty. Uh, they will perhaps face some consequences, including uh, incarceration. But you can you have a lot of power, potentially, as a criminal defense lawyer to, to mitigate that, to make that better for the client. That, and let's face it, they call us counselor for a reason. So beyond all the practical reductions of time, testing of evidence, constitutional confirmations, things of that nature, a lot of times you have clients in a very strange land we call the courtroom. People who don't know what's happening, who's who, what's what, what's about to happen to me, where do I stand, what do I wear, you know, do I say anything? There's a huge fear factor there. And above all else, you can serve 
as a counselor to someone and just talking them through the process. That I don't think we can minimize that as a huge benefit to someone to just kind of help them psychologically, emotionally, procedurally get through the system. And, and that is a huge public service as well uh, for clients. So a lot of different ways uh, to measure this, but yes, uh, anytime you either believe your client did the act that they were accused of doing, or they admit it to you. That that doesn't in any way mitigate the opportunities for you to still assist them in a lot of different ways, including, yes, I mean, if you go to trial, even with a client who admits to you in an attorney-client privilege setting that they did the act, there's still a question of whether that act constitutes the crime with which they're charged. So, yes, uh, in all of that kind of uh, uh, broad uh, sense, there's there's a lot that can be done, even if you believe or have been told that your client uh, did what they are accused of doing. Well, thank you, John. I see we're coming up on the top of the hour, so our time is about up. But uh, I very much enjoyed our conversation today, and uh, I thank you for being here. And uh, let me turn it back to Rachel, see if she's still around and wants to uh, conclude, conclude a few things. Uh, I am still around. And I really enjoyed the conversation as well. Lots of great information, John. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, and thank you to everyone that, that joined the call. We'll be following up uh, by email with the recording of the sessions, but if you would like to rewatch it, you certainly can. But Frank, John, thank you. And I uh, hope everyone has a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.